morning and welcome to the February Pacific Northwest Dews, Drought, and Climate Outlook webinar. Thanks for joining us this morning. My name is Paris Edwards and I'm with the USDA Northwest Climate Hub. Uh, this is a bi-monthly webinar series. It's hosted by NIDIS, the Northwest Climate Hub, and OCRI. It's designed to provide stakeholders in the Pacific Northwest with timely drought and climate information. And each webinar is tailored to reflect recent, current, and forecasted conditions and climatic events. It also includes discussions of observed impacts and other relevant updates from across the region. This webinar is being recorded and we'll post it on drought.gov along with other supporting materials later this week. And please note that after today's webinar, you'll have the opportunity to provide feedback that'll help us improve the series. So do take a moment and let us know what you think. Today's speakers include Karen Bambaco from the Office of the Washington State Climatologist, who will present the climate recap and current conditions. Then we'll hear from Andy Bryant with the National Weather Service Weather Forecast Office in Portland, Oregon, who will present the climate outlook. Next, we have Amy Garrett and Matthew Davis from Oregon State University, who will talk about dry farming as a drought response. And finally, we'll learn about winter melt trends and connections to potential widespread declines in snow water resources from Keith Musselman at the University of Colorado Boulder. Before we move on to the presentations, we'll briefly highlight the partners that make this webinar series happen. The Northwest Climate Hub develops and delivers science-based region-specific technologies and practical information that assist agricultural and natural resource managers with climate-informed decision-making in Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and Alaska. The Oregon Climate Change Research Institute, OCRI, is a network of over 150 researchers housed at Oregon State University. The vision of OCRI is to achieve a climate-prepared Northwest by building a climate knowledge network, cultivating climate-informed communities, and advancing the understanding of regional climate impacts and adaptation. NIDIS was established in 2006 by public law. Its mission is to improve the nation's capacity to proactively manage drought-related risks by providing the best available information to those affected, as well as resources to assist the potential for drought and to better prepare for, mitigate, and respond to its effects. NIDIS is building the foundation of a national drought early warning system through the development of regional dues where networks of partners and constituents share information and actions that help communities cope with drought. While the ultimate goal is a national early warning system, NIDIS recognizes that impacts and early warning information differs across the regions. So ultimately, each dues reflects its specific needs. The PNW dues is, was officially launched in February of 2016, and you can find information on current activities and the region's strategic plan on the drought.gov website. To facilitate the early warning system, more precipitation observations are needed. We encourage you to join COCORAS, the Community Collaborative Rain, Hail, and Snow Network. This is a unique, nonprofit, community-based network of volunteers of all ages and backgrounds working together to measure and map precipitation and report on local conditions. The observations of precipitation and lack thereof represent valuable data points that capture and improve our understanding of weather. And you can keep in mind that COCORAS does provide free training to those who join. We're starting the regular practice of providing timely information that's relevant to the PNW dues. This month, we wanna share that the first annual Pacific Northwest Water Year Impact Assessment is now available. Karen will give a brief overview of the assessment during her presentation and you can find the full report on drought.gov at the link shown here. NIDIS just launched a newly designed US drought portal. So you'll notice a slightly different look to the drought.gov site. Stay tuned for an overview of some of the new features during our next webinar in April. The Climate Impacts Research Consortium, CERC, is hosting a webinar that will discuss recent research on climate change and future flooding of the Columbia River. So mark your calendars for 11 a.m. on Friday, March 5th. We'll post a link to the webinar details in the chat box now and include them in our post-webinar email, along with a link to the associated research paper. 
Lastly, we'd like to draw attention to a call for proposals for the climate adaptation for climate adaptation research in the Northwest by the Northwest CAST. You can find more details about this opportunity at the link uh, and in our webinar follow-up email. As I hand it over to Cameron Bacco to kick off our presentations with a climate recap, I want to remind everyone to please feel free to use the chat box to ask questions at any time during the presentations. We'll address all questions at the end of our webinar today. And take it away, Karen. Great. Thank you so much, Paris. Can everyone, can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, good. I'm going to assume that's a yes. So I'm going to jump right in um, and talk about our regional climate conditions, starting with the first four full months of the 2021 water year, so October through January. And region-wide, we've seen warmer than normal temperatures. Um, and then some of those rankings are actually a little bit impressive. Um, Montana as a state has been as tied as the fifth warmest on record. So that's the statewide average temperature with the anomaly of just over three degrees Fahrenheit warmer than normal for the water year so far. Um, Washington and Oregon separately, um, both tied as the ninth warmest um, water year um, start. And then Idaho is a little um, less, but still 17th warmest. Um, so warm throughout the region is pretty, uh, pretty safe to say for most places. As in terms of precipitation, uh, we've seen a north-south gradient in terms of precipitation with drier than normal conditions in much of Oregon and Idaho um, and near normal to above normal conditions um, in Washington, northern Idaho and western Montana. I just wanted to focus um, on January as a whole, um, showing again those really warm temperatures especially in the northern region of the Pacific Northwest region, Washington, northern Idaho, western Montana. Um, the precipitation was more varied um, for January. Um, and I did want to point out the what are the normal conditions for the Washington and Oregon coast. Um, that'll kind of come up again later. Um, and then much wetter than normal conditions in kind of northeastern, north central Washington but still um, that dryness persisting in central Oregon, southern Idaho, and um, in northwestern Montana. So really for the start of the water year, we were getting a lot of questions of, well, where's our La Nina? Typically we experience um, cooler temperatures during La Nina events, but we really had an atmospheric circulation that favored warmer than normal temperatures. This is showing just for um, just for the month of January, um, but this circulation stuck around even earlier than that as well. Um, this is the 500 millibar geopotential height anomalies. So what I wanted to point out here was this kind of anomalous flow um, in the Gulf of Alaska here. And as that uh, air turned, as it approached our uh, coastline, the southerly direction really brought um, air that was warmer than usual to our region. So air that had recently been in Northern California, for example. Um, so that was partly responsible for why our temperatures were so warm at the start of the water year. But then of course, we all know what has occurred in recent weeks. Um, this is just February, the first, uh, fifth, or first few 15 days of February minus the first day. Um, but really cold temperature anomalies throughout almost the entire region, um, especially in Montana. And then of course we know the colds that the rest of the country, the central Northern Plains, and even, even in of course Texas, the tragedy that's going on there um, as well. But we had our, our cold weather too. And precipitation, we saw wetter than normal conditions throughout most of the region. Um, particularly in areas where that had missed out in earlier water year precipitation. So um, this area in the lower Columbia Basin in Washington, um, southern Idaho finally received above normal precipitation um, and so on. And a lot of that precipitation, of course, fell as snow because we had such cold temperatures. Um, this is a Kokoraz accumulated snow depth map um, for the snowy weekend in February, so for a few days there. And I really love Coco Raz 
for snow measurements that was mentioned in the beginning of this webinar, um, but it really fills in the holes um, since we don't have as widespread snow measurements here. Um, but we're talking accumulations, um, you know, up to over a foot in some areas, uh, the Southern Puget Sound, um, the Columbia Gorge really got a lot of snow um, over that period. And then even in Portland, of course, some of that fell as ice. That's this, this picture of the bicycle here in Oregon City, which is just southeast of Portland. Um, and then a lot of the passes too were um, in, impassable. <laughs> Um, so this is the U.S. Highway 2, a photo um, from Washington, where our passes were closed for, for several days at a time. Um, we also had power outages in our neck of the woods, um, Oregon in particular, in the Will Willamette Valley area. Um, and there was also a state of emergency declared um, for the storm damage, from mostly from the ice that occurred in that region. So why are we seeing this all of a sudden? Well, we finally have an atmospheric circulation that reflects a La Nina pattern. So something that we would expect to see during a La Nina, um, where here we would have the, we have the anomalous flow um, out of the Northwest, more aimed over Washington, Oregon, and Idaho, uh, bringing in that uh, those cooler temperatures and favoring snow in our region. So what does that look like in the mountains? Um, they've improved greatly for February. Actually, I checked this morning and the picture is even looking a little better than is shown here. Um, percentages of normal. Um, Washington snowpack is looking really good. Um, really the only places to keep an eye on at this point are uh, Southern Oregon and Southern Idaho where um, we're seeing about 80% to 90% of normal snowpack. Um, so not terrible, but a place to keep an eye on. And then I also wanted to show just the growth in the snow water equivalent. So this is the change in snow water equivalent from the end of January to February 18th. And you can see those blue colors in the Cascades, especially um, Northern Cascades in Oregon, all the Cascades in Washington um, receiving, you know, over 10 inches of snow water equivalent in the mountains just in the, the first little bit of February here. So our situation has greatly improved thanks to this uh, February cold in terms of drought. Uh, this is the latest drought monitor that came out last week and we still see some extreme drought uh, in, um, and I'm sorry, I'm just realizing Montana wasn't on this picture. Sorry about that, Montana. Um, extreme drought in Oregon and Idaho. A lot of this is leftover uh, dry conditions from the 2020 water year, the last water year that was really dry. Um, if you look at the changes that we've seen in the drought monitor over the last two months, we've really seen a lot of improvements um, in the Northwest in general. I uh, wanted to point out coastal Oregon, um, which I noted has been wetter than normal. We've seen a lot of improvements east of the Cascades in Washington on the northern side um, where we received some precipitation. Um, and then places that have stayed the same. Um, so a lot of that drought monitor depiction is a holdover from um, last water year, but then um, some an, oops, an introduction of uh, some dry conditions in western Montana and, and northern Idaho too. Um, this is uh, from the Northwest Climate Toolbox, a really nice snapshot of current conditions um, that I wanted to point out for the water year precipitation. The first plot I showed just went through the end of January, but this goes for the whole water year through February 19th. And you can see that um, really for most of the region, we're looking pretty good in terms of our, our total precipitation. Um, again, Southern Idaho, Southern I um, Southern Idaho and Southern Oregon are the worst off spots. And our recent precipitation has looked really good throughout the region. Um, the soil moisture is still really dry east of the Cascades and through Southern, um, Southern Idaho. Um, sorry, I just kind of, I thought that I had one more slide, but I didn't. Um, so back to the soil moisture, um, I would like to look at another product too, just to make sure that um, that's really well represented because I know that it's frozen now. So sometimes that can be uh, questionable in terms of the soil moisture at, at this time of year. Um, I also wanted to, so it was mentioned earlier, but this is hot off the presses, the Pacific Northwest 2020 water year um, impacts assessment report. 
uh, just released this morning on a Monday. So unlike the news of Kim and Kanye's divorce, we didn't want to bury this on a Friday. Um, so hopefully uh, this gets circulated a lot this week. Um, and this was a really collaborative effort between um, all of the logos listed here um, coming at NIDAS helped lead this uh, collaboration from a drought coordination group in the Northwest. Um, and a lot of this also came out of the water year meetings that were held in, well, virtually, of course, but the Washington and Oregon water year meeting and the Idaho uh, meeting that was held in the fall. So what, what those participants had said in terms of the impacts of the 2020 water year, as well as a regional survey that was developed um, and also sent out around in the fall. So the report is finally out um, and it's available at this link and I hope you guys like it. And if not, we'd like to hear feedback on it because we are hoping to make this um, more of a, a, a standard thing from year to year. So just to summarize, the water year remains on the warm side, uh, despite the recent cold February temperatures, um, even with that cold included, we're still warmer than normal. Uh, water year precipitation is below normal in central Oregon and southern Idaho, near normal to above normal in the rest of the region. Our mountain snow is really looking good, um, even better after this weekend. And the drought monitor continues to reflect the dry conditions um, of mostly from the 2020 water year, um, although there is, of course, continued dryness during this water year as well. So that's all I had. And I think we usually save questions for the end unless there's a clarifying question for now. Thanks, Karen. Um, I think uh, I don't see any clarifying questions, uh, and I think we'll just move on to the Climate Outlook with Andy Bryant. All right, good morning. Uh, I'll start with a mic check. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Great. <clears throat> All right, and let me get my slideshow into... All right, and I'll just mention to you if uh, I, I'm working from home today and don't have uh, real high quality internet. And so if I'm advancing slides and you hear me start referencing something that you don't see showing up on the screen, please uh, chime in and let me know. All right, and. There we go. All right, uh, here is what I'm gonna cover today. Um, just giving an update on the uh, status of La Nina and what's expected to evolve over the next few months. I will um, provide a, a quick outlook just looking at the next couple of weeks since we've had a pretty active pattern lately. Wanna look at how that um, will play out through the rest of February and the first few days of March and then get into the monthly and seasonal outlooks from the Climate Prediction Center. Um, I wanna show a few slides just to focus on um, uh, La Nina expectations for high elevation areas in the Pacific Northwest based on what we've seen historically during La Nina conditions. Um, talk about uh, projections for drought uh, how it's expected to evolve over the next few months, and then uh, water supply forecast for uh, the Pacific Northwest. We do have ongoing La Nina conditions in the eastern tropical Pacific, like Karen mentioned, and the projection is for a slow transition back to neutral conditions uh, by this summer. Um, there's a, a pretty wide range of model guidance, but um, the consensus is for uh, general moderation towards neutral conditions. Um, looking at uh, the outlook for the next couple of weeks, so I know there's a lot of graphics on this screen. Um, on the left are a couple of graphics from the Northwest River Forecast Center. And this is looking at the next 10 days, a summation of the forecast precipitation amounts. Uh, the upper, upper graphic 
shows the actual amounts, and then the lower graphic shows that in terms of a percent of climatology for the, the same 10-day period. And so you can see a lot of variability. Um, the Washington Cascades and then much of the uh, Idaho and Western Montana Rockies and a little bit of the Blue Mountains in Northeast Oregon show uh, above average. Um, most of the rest of the area, including um, the areas that have ongoing drought concerns in uh, central southern Oregon and southern Idaho look to be pretty dry over the next 10 days. Um, on the right are the Climate Prediction Center 8 to 14 day outlooks. Um, just highlighting an expectation of continued below average uh, temperatures across much of the western U.S., including the Pacific Northwest, and then um, likelihood of near to below average precipitation, in, and that's in that 8 to 14 day period. So a little bit of overlap between these two uh, outlooks on the left and right, but um, basically continued cool conditions. Um, most of the precipitation will be focused on the northern half of the Columbia Basin, um, mostly in uh, the Washington Cascades and uh, northern Idaho Rockies. All right, moving then to the March outlook. Um, I don't know if other folks would have the same impression, but I feel like the projections from the Climate Prediction Center for uh, the latter part of winter and the spring have been, it's been a pretty consistent message since last fall that um, there for late winter and early spring, there's a, an enhanced likelihood of below average temperatures. So remember with these Climate Prediction Center outlooks, and uh, maybe this is for anybody who's listening in on this who's not real familiar with these products, there's a, a, a starting assumption that there's equal likelihood of near average, below average, or above average, and then based on various factors such as uh, ENSO and different atmospheric oscillations that affect climate along with long-term climate trends, and there is a, a weighing of those odds towards um, above or below average. And so for temperatures shown on the left, um, below average temperatures are more likely uh, and then for precipitation on the right, um, some of the Pacific Northwest, mainly uh, Idaho and Western Montana, in this area of a slight enhancement of above average precipitation likely. Looking then at a three month outlook that includes March, but also extends to April and May. Um, Overall, a similar signal, but mainly confined to the state of Washington for the uh, likelihood of below average temperatures and above average precipitation. The EC that's shown on these graphics represents equal chances uh, for near, above, or below temperatures and precipitation. Jumping ahead a couple of months and looking into the late spring and uh, first part of summer, May, June, July. The message, the big message here is above average temperatures are likely for all of the continental US, including the Pacific Northwest. And some highlight for below average precipitation. Um, climatologically, the, uh, we see a, a pretty rapid decline in um, monthly average precipitation as we go through the spring. So um, by the time we get to May and June, typically the amounts are uh, not significant in terms of our water year precipitation and overall water supply, but uh, on a local uh, basis, they can be significant, um, especially if we're on the high side for precipitation. But typically by the time we get to, to mid-June, we're generally dry across the Pacific Northwest. All right, so I want to take a look at a, another um, kind of a different way to look at this 
And this is going to focus on four climate zones um, that are uh, high elevation areas in different parts of the Pacific Northwest. So the, the four graphics on the right highlight these four zones that we're going to look at, um, east slopes of the Cascades in Washington, uh, much of the Sawtooth Range in Idaho, the Northern Oregon Cascades, and then um, what the um, Climate Center calls the High Plateau Climate Division, um, which would uh, be kind of South Central uh, Oregon. And so what I'm going to what I did is I used the um, NOAA's local climate analysis tool to look at uh, February through April temperatures and precipitation and look at how um, we, what kind of a comparison we see during um, La Nina, Enso neutral, and El Nino conditions. So um, we're going to start with the east slopes of the Cascades. <clears throat> for the state of Washington. And uh, the graphic on the left is for precipitation. The graphic on the right is for temperatures. And so this is, again, this is looking historically in 1950 through 2020. And in general, there's, um, I think it's 18 La Nina cases and something like 37 El Nino and then about 20, or sorry, 37 Enso neutral and about 20 El Nino. And so we see a pretty consistent trend for um, all of these areas uh, that we're going to look at for precipitation. Typically in this February through April period, um, we're more likely to have above average precipitation. And even a stronger signal for below average temperatures. So that's this graphic is for the east slopes of the Washington Cascades. Moving ahead to the Idaho uh, Bitterroot Mountains, slightly above average um, on average for La Nina cases um, for precipitation, and then for temperatures. Uh, again, a pretty strong signal of below average temperatures observed historically uh, for this climate division. Moving to the Oregon, uh, North Oregon Cascades. Um, again, very similar signal. Uh, above average precipitation is typical during La Nina for this February through April period, and below average temperatures. Pretty strong signal there still um, relative to uh, average and also what we typically see during neutral and, and, and El Nino conditions. And then uh, the last area to highlight is the Oregon High Plateau. Um, again, precipitation a little bit above average during La Nina. Uh, and then temperatures, pretty strong signal there. Most cases, well below average. Uh, for temperatures. So what's, what, what is the point of these graphics? Uh, the point is that um, we are likely to see uh, continued building of snowpack through the spring, uh, especially uh, will be especially beneficial for areas where we have ongoing drought conditions in Oregon and Southern Idaho. Um, we're very dependent on that a natural stored reservoir of snowpack to sustain stream flow in the spring and summer months. So um, historically, we've seen uh, generally cool and wet conditions in our high elevation areas across the Pacific Northwest. All right, then moving ahead to the drought outlook, um, we're likely to see some uh, continued improvement throughout much of um, southwest and north central Oregon, and that's been to the Columbia Basin in Washington. Uh, we're also likely to see persistence of drought across south central and much of eastern Oregon, and then some of the areas in Idaho and western Montana, 
all also have ongoing drought conditions. The last thing I want to show are uh, water supply forecasts. Uh, and these forecasts are uh, updated on a daily basis by the Northwest River Forecast Center and the uh, California Nevada River Forecast Center. So the, the larger graphic on the right <clears throat> shows the um, ensemble stream flow prediction natural forecast. Uh, these are April through September. Uh, forecast periods for each of these locations and the, the value that's shown is the uh, percent of average uh, currently forecast for the basin above that point and so um, these values really you know this is another way to picture what has already been talked about with conditions across the Pacific Northwest that generally we have uh, normal to above normal conditions for Washington and northern Idaho. And <clears throat> below average conditions for uh, southwest Oregon and much of central and eastern Oregon and southern Idaho. The graphic on the lower left is the same kind of information from the California Nevada River Forecast Center. Uh, <clears throat> the CNRFC is the forecasting for the Klamath Basin, which is an area that has been in the midst of um, uh, drought conditions since the 2020 water year and uh, has had pretty low water year precipitation and snowpack to date so far this year. All right, to summarize, <clears throat> we're expecting La Nina conditions to moderate to ENSO neutral by the summer. The outlook for temperatures is uh, that below average temperatures are likely for the spring, with above average temperatures likely for the summer months. Precipitation near to above average likely for the spring, not as strong of a signal as we see for uh, temperatures. And then a below average precipitation likely for the summer, but again, uh, typically our summer precipitation amounts are pretty small relative to our uh, water year totals. Mountain snowpack is likely to build through the spring months. Uh, that's good news to uh, hopefully sustain spring and summer stream flow. Uh, drought is likely to persist across much of Oregon, Southern Idaho, and parts of Western Montana. And uh, as we just talked about, water supply forecasts are near to above average for the northern half of the Pacific Northwest, and generally below average for the southern half, with the exception of coastal areas of Western Oregon. And that's all I have. I will pass it back to you. Thank you, Andy. Uh, and next, we're going to turn to Amy and Matthew. Thank you. Uh, so this is Amy Garrett, and I work with Oregon State University. So Matt Davis and I, in collaboration with uh, Alex Stone, who is our vegetable crop specialist at OSU, and Andy Gallagher, who is a soil scientist with Red Hill Soils, um, and also a student worker, Brad Ramsey, um, helped us to uh, do this uh, study this past year in 2020. So we're going to be talking about um, some of the uh, uh, findings from that work. So just briefly, I'm going to touch on um, the what, why, and how of dry farming. A lot of farmers, um, so dry farming, first of all, is crop production during a dry, a dry growing season without irrigation. So in the Willamette Valley here, we typically see less than two inches of precipitation between um, June and October. So this is when a lot of our summer crops are in the ground. Uh, tomatoes, potatoes, squash, melon, dry beans, corn. 
So a lot of growers that, um, so I work with the OSU Extension Small Farms Program. A lot of the growers I work with directly are uh, on land without water rights or limited water avail availability, in particular new and beginning farmers. In the top right, you can see the Columbia Basin in 2015. So that was a year, a drought year um, that some of you may remember. And a lot of growers who are used to irrigating throughout the growing season had their irrigation restricted by the water master uh, quite early, some as early as June. So, um, so that was uh, quite an eye opener. Uh, the Dry Farming Collaborative uh, initiated the year after that in 2016. So we held a dry farming demo and generated a lot of interest in uh, strategies that support dry farming uh, for all these issues related to the water challenge. Uh, in addition to reduced inputs and enhanced flavor. So dry farming has, um, there's multiple, uh, lots of growers in our area interested in pursuing this as a drought, um, as an adaptation strategy uh, for many reasons. And in this presentation, we're not gonna be able to go, we don't have time to go into all the practices that support dry farming, but in the lower left uh, corner there, you see Intro to Dry Farming Organic Vegetables. This is an extension publication that I pulled together with the help of um, multiple farmers in 2019 that highlights the practices that support dry farming. So for this uh, project um, funded by the University Corporation of Atmospheric Research, um, we are evaluating uh, dry farming as a drought response and uh, exploring some different soil management strategies in the dry farm context. The, our goal is to um, identify soil management practices that increase uh, plant available water, and, um, as well as crop yield and quality of tomatoes. And our research objective was to better understand how dry farming in Western Oregon and Washington can be used as a drought resilient strategy. So work is needed to understand uh, the role of soil health and fertility and management in that. And uh, highlighting some rationale, some, there's a, some common thoughts and approaches or potential myths around dry farming that uh, we're just beginning to evaluate. Um, and this study helped support us in moving forward uh, that in 2020. So there's um, a compost, uh, there's a thought that moron is better. Um, deep, deep mulch is thought to uh, improve uh, soil moisture retention uh, and crop productivity in a dry farm context. Um, gypsum is, um, is thought to improve subsoil fertility, root growth, and also crop yield. And dust mulch is kind of a traditional or historical uh, dry farm method, which involves cultivation uh, to a depth of six to eight inches uh, and is thought to help conserve soil moisture. Uh, there's also a common approach of managing fertility for dry farm vegetables, the same as irrigated. So a lot of folks are applying fertility right before planting. Um, and there's also a tendency with weed management um, in uh, both irrigated and dry farm settings to let things go once the crop get established. Um, so we're just, we uh, integrated some of these uh, common thoughts or approaches um, into our study to evaluate. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to Matt Davis, who uh, led our field research. Yes, uh, hello. Uh, this is Matt Davis. I'm going to give a little talk about what we did uh, for our experiment. So we put together an experiment to test these different theories that Amy just outlined. Our primary goals were first to reduce soil moisture losses throughout the season. So we were able to look at soil moisture losses using watermark sensors, which allow us to, um, you know, we install these sensors at different depths and they tell us the soil water potential or how much, um, you know, how much water is in the profile. We also wanted to um, improve crop productivity and yield. So we wanted to test and see if these different management strategies improved yield. And then finally, we wanted to uh, try and reduce losses of fruit to blossom and rot. Uh, blossom and rot is a physiological disorder affecting tomatoes, especially prevalent in dry farm tomatoes in the Willamette Valley. Uh, on exposed sites, we find that about 50% of tomatoes get this disorder. And there are a number of strategies and ways of maybe controlling it, um, but we were interested in seeing how soil management you know, strategies might affect blossom and rot. So here is um, our experiment. Uh, it's a randomized complete block design. Um, there were eight treatments. 
so the it was replicated. It was at Oregon State University, uh, the vegetable research farm. There were 32 plots total, 672 plants in the experiment. You can see them all here. The crop was early girl tomato, a common dry farm tomato variety. The site was exposed, so there was a wind coming in from the north, those, uh, those winds uh, that blow through the Willamette Valley. It also had 12 inches of available water holding capacity, which uh, is the amount of water the soil can hold. Uh, that's very high. That's probably the best soil you can use in the Willamette Valley. And you can see here, this little box outlines one of our 32 plots. So there are 21 plants in each plot, 16 plants around the border, and then five experimental plants in the center of the plot, which we actually collected data from. These are the treatments. You can see it, the experiment was broken into two kinds of treatments. We had amendment treatments and floor management treatments. For the amendment treatments, you can see we have control, compost, gypsum, high nitrogen and low nitrogen. And you can see that the treatments differed in the amount of compost, fertilizers that were applied, um, but they were all the same in floor management. They were all clean cultivated with a wheel hoe. Whereas for our floor management treatments, we have control, dust mulch, leaf mulch, and weedy. They all received the same amendments and they differed in the floor management strategy. So you can see the leaf mulch received four inches of leaf mulch. The dust mulch was tilled to a depth of six to eight inches after rain events. The weedy treatment did not get cultivated at all. So those were the treatments that we tested. And here's the experiment right after planting. You know, these plants did not receive any water. They were not watered in, they were just planted. Um, they did receive about 2.2 inches of rain after planting, uh, so that probably helped, but they look kind of, you know, vulnerable here. You probably look at them and worry a little bit. But here, we did, we did get a lot of tomatoes. Um, this is uh, our harvest on August 24th. This was actually our third largest harvest, and you can see all the treatments are represented here. We got the weedy treatment, we got the leaf mulch, the dust. This is uh, for one block. So like I said, we had those four replications. We had four blocks. This is just one of those blocks. And this maybe gives you an idea of how many tomatoes we had to count and weigh and sort to get an idea of what was going on. And now let's get into our data. So what did we find? First, looking at the floor management treatments, we found that the dust mulch and the control did the best of all the floor management treatments. They had the highest total and unblemished yield. So that's yield of fruit without blossom and rot. They had the largest fruit of the four floor management treatments, and they had the lowest blossom end rot incidence of the floor management treatments. You can see here, 53% blossom end rot, BER, short for blossom end rot, compared to 81% and 72% blossom end rot. So those are much higher. However, there were no significant differences between the control and the dust mulch, which suggests that dust mulching might not be necessary. You know, it's sort of a controversial technique. And at least with tomatoes at this time, we didn't find any evidence that dust mulching, you know, significantly conserved soil moisture or helped with uh, yield and productivity. The leaf mulch uh, did appear to help the plants conserve water. So those watermark sensors I was talking about, they, um, they showed that water was being used more slowly under the leaf mulch. However, there were significant problems with the crop. So like I said, leaf mulch treatments uh, reduced uh, the soil water potential decrease, um, but it also resulted in lower unblemished yields, smaller fruit, and more blossom end rot than the control. And uh, this could be for a number of reasons. Um, one of the possible reasons is, is that, uh, you know, it might have increased uh, fertility. You know, the, the leaf mulch um, had nitrogen in it. Um, and, and also because it was reducing evaporation from the soil, um, it may have increased uh, fertility um, available to the plant. We'll get a little bit into the effect of fertility on blossom and rot in a second. So the final treatment to talk about for the floor management treatments was the weedy treatment. It performed the worst of all of them. So it was the most drought stressed. Uh, you know, it had the lowest total and unblemished yields of all the treatments. It had smaller fruit than the control and it had more blossom end rot than any other treatment. So definitely want to weed your farm. And we believe that this is because weeds compete with the crop for water and nutrients. Looking at the amendment treatments, again, this is the same sort of figure. You can see the percent blossom end rot along the bottom, there are different treatments. The first thing to note is that increasing soil fertility resulted in increased blossom end rot. You know, the compost treatment right here had the highest blossom end rot of all the uh, different treatments. It also had the highest soil nutrient contents and concentrations. You know, when we actually took soil tests, the compost had the most nitrogen, it had the most phosphorus and potassium. 
And this potentially resulted in, uh, you know, it's high blossom end rot and reduced unblemished yields. We also found that blossom end rot increased with nitrogen application. So 47% blossom end rot for the low nitrogen treatment, the control had 53% blossom end rot, and then the high nitrogen treatment had 61% blossom end rot. And if you look at that as a, um, as a continuous variable, if nitrogen applied as a continuous variable, you know, here we see 40, 100 pounds of nitrogen per acre, 160 pounds of nitrogen per acre for that high nitrogen treatment, we see blossom end rot increasing. So this is blossom end rot incidence. The uh, table, I mean, the figure on the, on the right is that separated by block. So you can see little differences between the blocks um, in how they responded to treatment. And then finally, looking at the gypsum treatment, uh, gypsum did not reduce blossom end rot. Now, you know, historically, people have thought that calcium deficiency is what results in blossom end rot, but here we're showing that it might be more of an effect of soil fertility and that, you know, maybe by reducing fertility inputs, we can control blossom end rot in a dry farm system. So, you know, we've talked a little bit about the data. We should talk a bit about what we're going to be telling farmers, the big takeaways that we're going to be presenting to them, uh, like at our winter meeting, for example, which is later this week. The first thing that we would want to tell them is that diligent weed management is especially important for dry farmers. You know, those uh, weeds suck up a lot of water and they reduce, um, you know, the productivity of the crop. Next thing to take away is to not over fertilize dry farm tomatoes. You know, we don't know the effect of fertility on other crops, but it definitely seems like too much fertility from compost or nitrogen fertilizers may result in increased blossom end rot. Next takeaway is that dust mulching did not significantly increase yield or quality of dry farm tomatoes compared to surface cultivation, which was our control. Um, so, you know, you still want to control weeds, you still want to, you know, protect the surface of the soil. Um, but dust mulching, you know, it's controversial. It, it destroys the soil structure. It could potentially lead to um, wind erosion. And so, you know, maybe discontinuing this practice if it has no, you know, substantial benefit uh, might be worth considering. And then the final big takeaway is that leaf mulch having a negative impact on dry farm tomato production. Um, I talked a bit earlier about how uh, it resulted in these sort of physiological disorders with tomatoes, possibly because the tomato plants were either getting nutrients from the leaf mulch or that the uh, leaf mulch was keeping soil nutrients at the surface available for the plants for longer by preventing evaporation. But uh, either way, you know, this was uh, probably our biggest, most shocking result that we found. And, uh, and it might not hold true for other crops, you know, um, it might not hold true for other leaf mulches. So definitely something we want to explore some more. And now I'm going to hand it off to Amy for future research. Thank you, Matt. So um, this was, uh, we're going to be doing ongoing research on um, and really moving towards understanding what the best practices are for floor management, fertility management in a dry farm context, because um, most resources out there are um, designed for irrigated systems. And um, so looking at what timing, what is the best timing for uh, applications of amendments, um, looking at different crops, different mulches, also, uh, there's a lot of interest in our group. There's a huge, uh, a lot of farmers realize that uh, soil health and available water holding capacity are, you know, really um, closely tied together. And uh, we're re really interested in looking at low and no-till approaches. On the right-hand side, there's some pictures um, of some of our evaluations of that. Uh, at the top is um, summer cover crop that we're gonna be transplanting into. Um, so we just laid that cover crop down and we'll be transplanting into that this May. And then the uh, Plant Material Center, um, the, the bottom two pictures show a, um, a cover crop that was, uh, uh, it was burned down with an organic herbicide, so weed slayer instead of Roundup. A lot of farmers were working with our organic farmers, so that was um, sprayed with uh, weed slayer and then rolled down. And then you can see on the bottom right that uh, that did a pretty good job of suppressing weeds. And um, so anyway, low and no-till approaches are a huge interest up, uh, to us. Cultural practices for improving um, dry farm productivity on marginal soils. A lot of growers aren't on a Chehala silt loam or a class one soil with water rights. So what are our tools for improving uh, productivity for dry farming on more marginal soil types? Uh, doing long-term studies, evaluating effects on soil health. We would love to um, 
uh, pursue funding for that in the future. And in the present, um, we're in the second year of a Western SAIR project that is funding uh, dry farm tomato production uh, study for the Willamette Valley led by Alex Stone. So we'll be continuing that in some form um, in 2021 with funds from Western SAIR. Thanks so much uh, to Amy and Matt. If you want to share details about your upcoming meeting at the end of the week, please feel free to put those details in the chat. And now we'll hand it over to Keith Musselman to wrap us up. Thanks, Britt. Just a minute while I share my screen. Okay. Um, can you confirm that you can see my, my slides? Looks great. Great, thanks. Okay, um, I'd like to first uh, introduce my co-authors. My name is Keith Musselman. Um, I'm at the University of Colorado Boulder. Uh, my co-authors are Don Zador, uh, Julie Vano, and Noah Molich. And we've been looking at, at using snow tell like sensors, so snow telemetry um, networks to, to monitor snowpack across Western North America. This is this cover slide is kind of interesting because it, it's a it's a great webcam um, that uh, a couple of colleagues have put up looking over the Senator Beck Basin in Colorado. And what I like about this, I've just I've just kind of blended this data, taking screenshots from different seasons of the same basin. On the left is the classic midwinter conditions, and in the middle is kind of mid-spring, and then summer on the right, early summer. Um, and so we we kind of set this hypothesis that what happens, what are the implications of changing seasons of, of this shift? in these kind of panels from spring conditions towards winter, um, which would be consistent with what we're expecting um, based on uh, current trends in temperature, um, but also projections uh, into the future. Um, so as Andy Bryant suggested, that snowpack and precipitation is carefully monitored across the US, particularly in the West, at these remote telemetry stations. Uh, this is an example of a, of a U.S. Uh, Natural Resource Conservation Service, or NRCS, snowpack telemetry or snow tell station. Uh, this is just up outside of Bend, Oregon. Um, and uh, we're using data from these, these telemetry stations to understand how trends in snowpack, but also trends in melt, and particularly winter melt, um, are, are changing. So we ask the questions, are, are the distinctly different accumulation and melt seasons that are illustrated in that cover slide becoming increasingly blurred? And if so, what are the implications? And so today I'm presenting new results from a, a paper that is uh, in press and should be coming out next month um, called Winter Melt Trends Portend Widespread Declines in Snow Water Resources. So to get to that, we first need a metric to assess winter melt. Um, so showing here is a, a snow water equivalent or SWE curve in black. Um, in, in millimeters, and in this case, this is a cold winter snowpack where that SWE continues to march um, up uh, in, in increasing um, value until about April uh, when melt progress, progresses in earnest. Um, underneath that bar, there's, there's a daily melt, and those little bars, those blue bars at the bottom are the daily melt signal um, that is also inferred from uh, a, a reduction in, in snowpack or SWE. Um, and then the, that red line is the cumulative annual melt. Um, and so we're presenting a metric called the fraction of total annual melt, or FM, on the date of maximum SWE. In this case, maximum SWE at this particular site occurred just after April 1st. Uh, you grab that, that cumulative annual melt at, to date um, and compare that to what you get at the end of the season um, in terms of the cumulative annual melt. Um, and so for this, example. Um, this is, a, again, a cold site, and that fraction of annual melt is 0 0.11, or the complement of that would suggest that 89% of annual snow water resources that fell at this site for this year remains available to melt on the date of maximum SWE. Now, you can imagine that you can almost hypothesize that warmer regions might have higher fractions of winter melt and are thus less effective snow water um, storage uh, systems than colder regions. 
regions. So that colder region example we showed on the left is 89% of, of that snow water equivalent is, is available to melt on the data max SWE. Um, this is another example on the right of a site in Oregon, um, just a, a sample year, um, showing that 45% of snow water equivalent is available on that uh, date of, of max SWE. And in this case, the, that date of max snow water equivalent is is the same, but you get very different um, mechanisms and efficiency uh, in terms of storage of water resources. So we asked the question, how has winter melt and SWE changed, snow water equivalent changed at observing snow observing stations over the last 30 uh, or more years? This is a, a, a map of all the stations. We have um, over a thousand snowpack telemetry stations, not just the Snowtel network that I mentioned, but also um, a couple of uh, agencies in Canada, particularly BC and, and uh, Alberta, uh, the Yukon government, uh, and then up the, the snow tile network that extends into Alaska. Um, and this is the date of maximum SWE, uh, maximum snow water equivalent relative to April 1st. So the histogram on the left, the colors correspond to the bin um, data on the right in the maps, um, whereas pinks and reds are occurring earlier, maybe by 30, 40, 60, up to 80 days earlier than April 1st. So that's kind of a midwinter um, max accumulation, whereas um, the blue dots are, are later. So you can see that there's, there's not only is there large variability, but this also interesting metric that on average over Western North America, the, the peak occurs very close to April 1st, which has historically been used to, to, um, to provide uh, water managers and, and, and resource managers uh, with information about snowpack. Um, so if you look at that melt metric that I, pre that I, that I presented, on average, 88% across North America, 88% of annual snow water resources remains available to melt, to melt on that date of maximum snow water equivalent. Um, and again, that's the complement of that fraction 0 0.12. You can see that um, colder regions, particularly interior um, Rockies, uh, have those darker blue colors corresponding to um, uh, low winter melt and, and then the warmer colors, kind of those, those oranges and yellows, are, are places where uh, winter melt uh, kind of occurs in, in earnest um, and, and on average. And so now we get to kind of the interesting stuff is how are these things changing? So we conducted a trend analysis using a Mann Kendall test and using um, a statistical significance of 0 0.05 um, and found that stations with winter melt. Has, the number of stations has increased at, at three times the number of stations with, with snowpack decline. So we all have seen uh, reports and, and in the media and, and in publications of, of large snowpack declines, and that's what's shown on the right. Those are all stations that have at least 30 years of reliable data, um, and anything that's a statistical, statistically significant trend is shown in the color. If it's lower max snow water equivalent on the right, it's a, a red dot, and higher max snow water equivalent um, is, is blue, and you can see in, in across the board uh, there the, the story is kind of this this predominance of red, predominance of, of uh, SWE losses, snowpack losses um, compared to this um, the blue dots. Um, Canada seems to be this interesting uh, zone where there are no statistically significant trends one way or the other, but across the West there is this scattering of, of lower max snow equivalent, about 69 out of uh, 634. Um, available stations. And on the left, that, this is the, that melt metric. And you can see that there's just an overwhelming trend of, of increased melt um, across Western North America, with that exception of, of perhaps um, British Columbia, um, again, indicating that there could be some, some decadal um, to interannual um, short-term trends in precipitation and or temperature that, that could be um, overriding and, and underlying warming underlying warming signal, for example. So in conclusion, just in the interest of time, um, we find that three times more stations have increasing winter snowmelt trends than snowpack declines. And in the paper, we go through a robust um, assessment of the drivers. We looked at the, at the climatology. We looked at the decadal patterns of, of temperature and precipitation. And we find that winter melt trends are highly sensitive to temperature, which is kind of intuitive, I think. And, and an underlying warming signal is climate change signal. Whereas snow water equivalent or snowpack trends are more sensitive to, to precipitation variability, these decadal patterns, which has a weaker uh, climate change signal than the temperature. And then um, our recent stability of, of 
it suggests that the re recent stability of Western US snow water equivalents since about 1980 uh, will be followed by an accelerated decline uh, once this, these current modes of climate, natural climate variability uh, subside. Um, and that is consistent with some, some other recent papers. And the main thing is, is that more winter snowmelt will complicate future water resources planning and, and management efforts. And I'm particularly interested, as, as we're writing a number of grants to, to look further into this, um, I'm interested to hear what stakeholders are observing. So, you know, I, I'm encouraging people to email me with questions or, or observations um, or concerns. You know, how might more winter snowmelt affect operations uh, in, in terms of flooding, uh, flood, flood mitigation, um, but also uh, um, projections and, and uh, short-term for forecasts to seasonal forecasts. And with that, I uh, thank you, thank you, and my email address is here um, if you are inclined to reach out. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Um, we are definitely over time. We, for those who can stick around, there are a few questions in the chat box. Um, if you need to go, we will capture these in the recording, and you can also reach out to the speakers themselves. We'll have a slide up in a moment with everyone's contact information. Um, but to just hop to it, for those who can stick around, there's a question about how often, and this one is for Karen if you're still with us, um, how often do the SWE percentage maps get updated? Hi there. Yeah, I'm still here. Um, so those are daily, and you can go to, um, they're from NRCS, um, and they have this really neat interactive tool where you can, you, even update, see today's conditions and then click backwards and see what they were a few days ago. I can send that, I can put that link in. That'd be great. And there's another request for a link, and I think this is for Andy. Could you link, add the link to the water supply forecast for April 4, through September? Um, sure. Okay, thank you. I will do that. And then moving on, um, there was a question for Matt um, regarding a study. Was the rain that you mentioned an unexpected? Was it was it unexpected in timing? Um, um, there were, yeah, go ahead. You know, we we anticipate a little bit of rain in May and June. Those plants were planted um, towards the beginning of May, beginning to mid May. Um, so you know that's not totally unexpected. And uh, does that answer your question? Can you hear me? Yeah, I think it did. Um, I think the second question is also for you. Um, and it was okay. asking, was the rain, or sorry, um, was there an analysis of average water cost versus dry farming um, or dry farming hit? So I think they're just generally asking if you either consider that in this study or maybe there's some previous work the group has done looking at analysis of average water costs for dry farming. Um, I don't know. That would be Amy. Yeah, I could just speak to that for a moment. Um, uh, there is going to be, we're working on um, doing kind of an economic analysis, which would include water. Um, Alex Stone wrote that into the Dry Farm Tomato Project. Um, so, and then there's also one of our partners in Washington with the, uh, Emily with the Washington Water Trust applied for a grant uh, and part of that would be looking at kind of like water economics uh, like water savings and looking at um, kind of cost benefits uh, of dry farming so we'd like to do that work but we have not um, yet done that okay thank you um, well I just I think that's it for questions um, I want to thank everyone for joining us today and just remind you that a recording will be available on drought.gov later this week as well as PDFs of the presentations. Um, actually, those can be accessed if you email Britt Parker, and her email is up here on the slide. If you have any additional questions, you can reach out to the speakers directly, like I mentioned. Um, and please remember to mark your calendars for the next webinar, which will be on April 26th. And uh, thanks for hanging around. Have a great Monday. <laughs>